Hi everyone, uh, my name is Marko Suvejic. I'm an uh, Associate Director of Digital Worlds Institute at University of Florida, uh, and I'm a director of a blockchain lab at University of Florida. Our work has been uh, helped to a great degree by Algorand Foundation that uh, powers our research work at the blockchain lab at UF. Um, at UF, we are doing a lot of work with education, research, and our research is focused on blockchain and art, and the way that those two things uh, interact with each other. So today, I will talk for 15, 20 minutes, and then I'll open up the floor for any questions, since often the most interesting conversations happen in that kind of an interactive format. Um, blockchain, as we know, has come to a horizon some 13 years ago, 2008, 2009, however we want to think of the first uh, Bitcoin um, coming to this um, reality of ours. And as every new technology comes along, uh, artists and creatives of this world think about what can we do with it? How can we creatively express ourselves by using this new technology. In the late 90s, we had a similar situation with internet, and we had internet art, and we had a networked art, and now we have uh, blockchain art, and different ways in which blockchain and art interact with each other. So when we talk about that, I want to present on three different ways in which we can Think of blockchain and art. First is um, art about blockchain. So art about blockchain is a category where traditional artists, be it sculptors or painters or something like that, uh, they create pieces that have blockchain for the topic. That's what they're commenting on, so to say. But the medium is still the original medium of that artist. Um, blockchain art is really the main focus that I would like to explore, which is art that uses blockchain as the medium. So what is that kind, what is the art piece that could not exist if blockchain did not exist? So it's something completely new. And then last but not the least, and probably the most popular way of thinking right now in terms of blockchain is blockchains as the means of payment and purchase tracking um, and facilitating art economy. The key word here that has been really becoming very popular is NFTs, but beyond NFTs, how is blockchain being leveraged by the art community? So here is an example of art about blockchain. This is work by an artist called Crypto Graffiti. Uh, Crypto Graffiti is one of those artists that made the name for themselves early on by commenting on blockchain. So here, what we have is a series of his works. Um, the gentleman there in the top row, let's see. Um, this is a, a Satoshi Nakamoto. It is not the Satoshi Nakamoto, the Satoshi Nakamoto being the very author of Bitcoin. Uh, this gentleman, for those who may not recognize him, happens to live in Palo Alto near Stanford, and he happens to be an engineer, and he happened to have a name Satoshi Nakamoto. So some five, six, seven years ago, um, he was discovered by media, and everybody thought that he was it, and he was swarmed, his house was swarmed by media, and um, you know, he's famously said, I will give an interview whoever buys me a free lunch. Um, somebody bought him a free lunch, he went for an interview and said, I have no idea what you're talking about. I am Satoshi Nakamoto, I have no idea what blockchain is. Um, and that was his interview. Now, 
And the fascinating thing about his story is that now he's a little bit of a celebrity and in conferences, um, he kind of appears as a celebrity because he's very recognizable in, in blockchain circles. Now, all that said, because he has become this kind of a celebrity, here he is. He is now a subject of an art piece. And this art piece, if you can see the details, it's actually a collage that is made out of cut up credit cards. So somebody cut up credit cards as a way to demonstrate kind of at the end of an old era, an end to the era that credit cards will no longer exist, right? Um, we will not need that intermediary in our world of blockchain transactions. So cut up credit cards representing here Satoshi Nakamoto. So these are different kinds of, again, uh, pieces that have um, blockchain as inspiration for what they are presenting. Crypto Graffiti, again, if you're interested, very popular uh, artist right now. Um, the second example that I have here is actually here in the region. This is in Slovenia, the city of Krajn. Um, the city of Krajn just installed this, well, I guess it's a sculpture. It's a, this is a bird's eye point of view. It's a car roundabout. Um, and it's a monument to Bitcoin. So once again, it literally is a monument to Bitcoin. And we can pretty much say that any art about something becomes a monument about that particular topic, right? Now, let's talk about blockchain art. This is what I think is really, really exciting. This is, hey, okay, we have this thing called blockchain, and what do we do with it? So why, what does blockchain have to do with art? And one of my favorite pieces, this is a piece by uh, artist uh, Primavera de Filippi, and what she did, she created this, let's call them androids, they're flowers. And these flowers are robotic, and they have these crystal balls. They can do like a little light show, um, and they can move and dance and stuff like that. So they're plants. They're she calls them plantoid, kind of like android, but plantoid. So these plantoids exist in a somewhat of a dormant state, and you can tip them in satoshis, satoshi being the smallest unit in which Bitcoin is being measured, right? Um, where 100 million satoshis is equal to one Bitcoin. So when we give, when we tip this plant, the plant does a little dance and a light show as a kind of a gesture of appreciation. And this whole thing is mimicking the dance of the bee with the flower, where the flower is looking to attract the bee, to give you something in order to get, for the bee to get pollen and to, you know, so, to cross-pollinate. Now, in this case, the plantoid is doing the same thing just for humans. So it's motivating you, it's like, oh, wow, okay, I can do it one more time, one more time, one more time. And as the digital wallet is increasing, at a certain point, a smart contract gets um, triggered, and that smart contract gives money to another artist to create another plantoid that is similar, not exactly the same. So ultimately, it's a process of procreation. It's the process where this plantoid is mimicking real world nature in terms of uh, bees and um, looking to kind of procreate. The same way, except that this way it's looking to create enough of a budget so next artist can make another plantoid in its likeness and continue on with the project. So project itself here, she's, she made the initial batch of these plantoids, and then she has a collaboration with other artists who are making the subsequent plantoids and creating almost like this new species um, of robotic plants. Now, um, Primavera de Filippi herself claims that um, in some way, the physical body of plantoid lives here, but the soul of plantoids live on the blockchain, because that's where all the, you know, all, all the tracking of all the data that brought life to each plantoid is being 
registered. So it's a conceptual piece, and I think that conceptual art is something that happens quite a bit with new technologies, because we're looking how to incorporate these new technologies into creative ways of thinking that we have had to date. Um, Discover Da Vinci is actually a project that I did with my research group at the University of Florida. Uh, what we did, we made this gamified, gamified app. Um, we were celebrating 500 years of the, from the birth of Leonardo Da Vinci, and we wanted to promote the knowledge of Leonardo Da Vinci among our students. So what we did, we created kind of a, a combination between a quiz and a car trading game. Um, where there was a quiz where you, if you get your answer correct, you get a little piece, and you're looking to build together different in, in, uh, inventions that Leonardo da Vinci did. So as you're collecting all these different pieces, uh, you're looking to put together these inventions, and each piece is being registered on blockchain, so we can trade these pieces, because let's say if I need three pieces to build a catapult, Catapult is actually has been invented by Leonardo da Vinci, um, but I keep having the same two pieces and I'm missing the third one. I can go to an exchange. We built an exchange where students can trade. You get your three pieces, and then you get entered into a prize drawing. So this was a phenomenal project. We did that about two years ago. Um, work with students, work with the University of Florida is 65,000 students, so it's easy to get volume because we have a lot of students. So when we promote something, we can get thousands of students to uh, participate. And it was interesting to see what was their feedback, what was um, interesting to them, what was not. And for us at the research lab, those are the questions that we're looking to answer. What was the big issue? So often with blockchain or any kind of a blockchain game or art, onboarding is a big issue, meaning OK, sure, but I don't have the blockchain, any crypto that you are using. So you're telling me I have to install the wallet, and what, I have to connect to my bank? So I have to pay money to do this? And that onboarding is difficult. So to somewhat uh, address that, um, we had a good collaboration with one of the blockchain protocols that allowed us to have a minimum, minimum, like, a dollar um, pre-sponsored digital wallet. So when somebody signs up, they immediately get like one dollar. And in order to buy these virtual cards, uh, all they needed was like a few cents. So that's all they needed to play the game. So by giving us a gift of like thousand dollars to promote their blockchain, um, we were able to onboard students with ease, which I think is was a you know phenomenal. Uh, type of collaboration. Um, here we can see another image where we are collecting these cards, and then ultimately when you collect it, we are fortunate to have a really good production studio, so we had opportunity where that catapult then shows up in augmented reality, and you can kind of look around it with your phone. Um, and I think that that is the future, that, co that combination of augmented reality, blockchain, uh, <clears throat> and AI. These are three technologies that will absolutely define the next 10 years um, of our lives. So XR, XR being AR and VR, blockchain, and AI. Um, we will be interacting with data. All that data will be collected. Some AI will be crunching through that. And then everything will be written on a blockchain and accessed. So blockchain will be kind of like this background technology that runs it all. And that is, I think, one big thing that we often overlook. The blockchain is actually ultimately not so much of a B2C as much of a B2B technology, meaning it will be used everywhere. But ultimately, it will not be very visible. We will, it will just be making things run. How? the end user doesn't really need to know that at all. They just need to know that whatever they own, they can prove that it's there, if, if it's NFT, that if they register something, that it's real, nobody can change it, uh, that it's secure. How? It doesn't matter. Word blockchain, it doesn't matter. It will matter to research labs at universities. It will matter to 
companies that build, but I make video games and nobody asks me, my players don't ask me if I'm using Unity or Unreal Engine. They don't even know what that means. They just want to have a good game. That's it. Um, this was another, this is probably one of the most famous examples of gamified crypto art. These are uh, CryptoKitties. Uh, CryptoKitties was kind of like the very first thing that we ever had on Ethereum blockchain and actually kind of almost crashed the whole network. It was so popular. Um, where we have these kittens um, that each one has their DNA and they're all a little bit different. And each one now can cost several ETH, several ethers, um, meaning that these things go up to like $100,000 now getting even more. So these are kind of like a predecessors of bored apes that now are super popular. But um, CryptoKitties were actually the original crypto art that happened on blockchain and kind of kick-started the whole I mean, it's almost kind of like a madness that happened with NFTs in the last three years, where all of a sudden the world of art was given a new life. Um, art markets were somewhat stagnating. You can only resell Picassos so many times, and, but they're so expensive, I can't really participate. Majority of us cannot really participate in buying a Picasso. But all of a sudden, there were all these really cool original art pieces in NFTs that anybody can participate. And we can trade and do all kinds of fun stuff like that. Um, I added this slide just to kind of see how far the world has gone. So here we have 2017 CryptoKitties. Um, and 20 years earlier, 1997, I worked for a company called PF Magic, and at the time we made virtual pets, virtual cats and virtual dogs um, that had artificial intelligence engines. Um, in 97, we had an AI engine that was a on a level of a three-year-old, which at the time was the most advanced AI engine commercially available outside of the research labs at MIT and IBM and stuff like that. And you would adopt a virtual pet, um, train them, and then they will become unique. As a matter of fact, they will become so unique that when you have, if you want to mate them, their puppy will get characteristics from both. And at the time, all this was happening on our servers. And today, all that is going to be on blockchain. So it's not going to be on my server where I own the data to your pet and I can change it or upgrade it or do whatever. And you can't, you will not really even know. Um, I cannot do that on blockchain, especially if it's a public blockchain. And if I register your pet there with their AI and their DNA data, it is there and it's immutable. It cannot be changed anymore. The third topic that I wanted to talk about is blockchain-facilitated art economy. So there are a number of different ways in which blockchain is affecting this economy. Um, first and foremost, it's driving digital art sales through digital scarcity. What does that mean? Um, when the digital technology came about, and we started making 2D animations, 3D animations. Now we're making virtual reality models, so on and so forth. We entered this era of an art piece where we can have multiple identical art objects, where a digital photograph is identical to another digital photograph. A 3D model is exactly the same as any other 3D model. So what do we do in this era of absolute mechanical or digital reproduction? What do I buy? So if I like some really nice VR piece, OK, I mean, I kind of want to buy it maybe. Is it an art piece? OK, but what am I buying? Like, I'm buying it, but you have it too, and you have it too, and somebody else has it, and who actually has it? And can I actually sell this thing? Or 
how do I prove that I am the one who really owns this? Oh, well, you have to go, if it's a VR, you go to Oculus, and maybe they have some certificate. It just doesn't seem right. Um, and blockchain came to the rescue here, where all of a sudden we can have a small embedded code, and I can prove that my piece is the original piece. Now, that doesn't mean that I cannot, somebody cannot make an exact copy. In digital world, we can always have exact copies. But what it does mean, it means that I can prove that my copy is the one that is considered original, and I can now resell it. I mean, today in the world, in the time of 3D printers, I can make an exact same replica of any sculpture, right? So it's not an issue anymore like, oh, yeah, but I still like my molecules arranged in a particular way. Um, I have these conversations a lot. My, my mother is a painter and my sister is a sculptor, and they make things out of atoms, and they really believe that this is authentic. And it is, except that technology today can make an exact replica, including a little bit of a patina or dust that has created over the time, right? So now we can do the same thing. Now we have the same digital copies of digital works, and all of a sudden we can now say this is original and something else is not. The second thing here that I listed is democratizing fine art investments. This is a really huge thing. So art market as such is multi-billion dollar industry. And let's say if I am following certain trends, I can notice that, oh, you know, Picassos are trending up. How wonderful. Maybe I would love to invest in that. I just don't have $2 million to buy Picasso. It's just slightly bit out of my range. Um, but it would be really neat if, like, can we, like, have a Picasso that is, we can treat it almost as a company that has a stock, and then I can buy percentage ownership? And now we can. In other words, all of us here, we can decide to join in and to say, hey, we want to buy this piece of art that costs $2 million, and we'll divide it in, let's say, 2 million shares. And whoever wants to buy it can invest any amount, $2, $1, $0.50, $1,000, $500,000, right? And you own that percentage of it. And what's the purpose of it? Well, the same as if you bought that piece. Most likely, you're not going to hang it at home. It's going to be in the museum anyhow. And it's going to just resell in 10 years for double the money. And when it does resell, your percentage ownership will go up or down in value based on how the price of that painting has moved. So allows us, most of us, who are not venture capitalists, who are not millionaires, to participate in the art market in a way that we were not able to do that before. And the third one is reducing art forgery, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, this is the graph that I was able to dig out. It's about five years old. It's 2017. To show, in these five years, galleries had no intention to deal with blockchain technology at all. Um, auction houses, yeah, and intermediaries, not so much. In five years, everything is now almost 80%. Every single one of these categories is above 80%. And the last five years have been huge in both uh, in legitimizing and educating the galleries and the art world about the potential of blockchain. Um, I spoke a little bit about digital scarcity. You know, so how can we have a limited number of something? Can I have a 3D model? And can I have a portfolio of, oh, I'm going to have only 10 of them? I mean, you know, you can click Save hundreds of times, but only 10 will contain code that make my NFT original. That is really unique. I talked a little bit about democratizing fine art investment. And, and this is something that, in a way, the internet democratized access to knowledge. 
If I just think about before early 90s, if I wanted to learn something, I had to go to a library. And it was really hard to even find the right book on the right topic, and it took a long time just to get one book. Now, anybody with a PC and internet can get any kind of knowledge they want. They can work for anywhere in the world. That kind of democratization happened with internet. And now blockchain is doing the same thing with ownership and with investment, not just about art investment, any kind of investment. Real estate is another really big category that is being pushed right now in um, collaboration with blockchain. This is another same year, 2017. Um, look at this, no intention, more than 80% of payment in virtual currency. I would say that it, this is literally reversed now, if not more. I would say the auction houses, my, some of the last research that I did, almost 100% of auction houses are now willing to accept payments in crypto um, from their clients. Because it's simple, it's, it's easy, it's simple. Um, my money is in crypto. I don't have to worry about exchanges. I don't have to worry about where my money is coming from, country, so on and so forth. I'm paying in Bitcoin. You don't even need to know who I am. Why do you need to know who I am? I just want to buy, your, uh, buy a painting. Smart contract. I'm just bidding. And once I make a, bi a bid, I committed my money. That's it. Blockchain is cons uh, often, we talk about it as trustless economy. Trustless economy as of its economy that does not require trust. If there's a smart contract, I don't have to trust the person that I am conducting business with. I don't need to know who they are. I don't need to know their rating, nothing. There is a smart contract that says when this person literally puts certain amount of coins, whatever that coins are, uh, let's say Ether or Algo or certain things will happen. And no one can change that. They cannot change that. I cannot change it. Nobody can undo it. So at that point, I don't care who that person is. It's trustless as of no need for trust. And the last thing is the art provenance um, that we can now... Uh, prevent art forgery by being able to define which piece is original and which one is not. This is something that did not exist until blockchain came around. And again, this is the kind of thing that it's not like a, wow, like something for people to look and see. No, it's kind of a, oh, really? That's not how it always was? It's like when I talk to my kid and I try to explain them that when I was their age, there was no internet. They don't really understand why would any, what would computers were for if you don't have internet. I, you know, pretty soon, that's the same situation is going to happen here. It's like, how else were you recording anything if you didn't have blockchain? So those are the three things that I wanted to present today. I wanted to talk about, and I talked about blockchain art, art about blockchain, and blockchain-facilitated economy. Thank you very much. If we have two minutes, so if there are any questions, please let me know.